we had read about the um, woman who's taken in captivity and then he converts her and the Torah juxtaposes that to the law of the rebellious son which means the Torah is forecasting that if you marry this kind of woman through this process of conversion ultimately the child that you have from this woman will be that rebellious son what is the rebellious son that he will steal from his parents and will purchase a certain amount of meat and buy a certain quality wine, not an expensive wine, which is easily available. And this itself is an indication. And he drinks and eats the meat with a certain lesser quality of society, which is an indication that he's developing a certain lifestyle pattern, which ultimately will develop into an addiction. And his parents go to the Bezdin and they tell them, our child is this rebellious, gluttonous child. And it's interesting, the Gemara tells us in Sanhedrin that if a minor transgresses, there's no liability. One has to be an adult. So if that is the case, why is it called Ben Soram Morer? He should be referred to as Ish. Ish always means an adult. Why is he referred to as Ben? So the Gemara explains in Sanhedrin that when are you able to discern between a minor and an adult? That if a, a minor cannot impregnate a woman, but a person reaches puberty and he has relations sexually with a woman, she could be impregnated from the moment he reaches puberty, but it'll all be not noticed after three months because it takes three months from conception for the pregnancy to be noticeable. It takes three months only after the first trimester. So the law of Ben Mora is only a three month window from the age of 13 till the age of 13 and three months, meaning that it's still questionable, is he Ben, is he a, a minor, or is he an adult? So since during this three month period, it's not obvious whether he's a minor or an adult, only then when he behaves in this unacceptable way, could he assume the status of the classification of Mitzor Mora? If it's afterwards, if the parents, if he committed this transgression after 13, three months, where it's then, if he would have had relations with a woman, it would have been obvious he's an adult, then this law doesn't apply to him. Discuss this in a moment. So it's only if this happens during from the age of 13, puberty, three months. After that, it has no relevance any longer. So if the first time they take him to court, the parents, the court gives him, give, gives him lashes. And they forewarn him that if it re should repeat itself, you should become a repeated offender, you're going to be put to death. Why? Because once a person assumes this lifestyle, this mode of behavior, ultimately, it's going to create an addiction. And if a person has an addiction, he has to be able to support it. And if he can't take from his parents, what is he going to do? He's going to resort to other illegal means to acquire that kind of money, even if he becomes a highway, highway person, a, a bandit, which ultimately would lead him to kill for that money to support the habit. And if he becomes a murderer, he's going to be put to death. So the Torah tells us, since we see the direction which he's going, that ultimately he's going to be, become a murderer to support his habit, better take his life now when he's relatively innocent, then allow him to transgress to a further point where he'll be deserving murder, the death penalty for committing murder. And the words of Chazal are, Mutav shiyomu zakai val better he should die relatively innocent 
rather than more liable, meaning for a more serious level of transgression, which is murder. That's what the Torah says. That's Lopez Soromora. But it's only if the parents bring him to court. The father and mother have to bring him to court and claim that he is, this is his behavior. If other witnesses see it, that's not a basis. It's not based on it's not based on evidence. It's based on the parents, of course, the parents who witnesses that this was the misbehavior. But if a third party sees this and brings tests, testifies in court, the parents have to be the ones who bring the child. Why? As we say, Zerasakosov, why is it only during this three-month period window from the age of 13 to 13th round, three months? That's what the Torah says. We don't understand it. It's a chok. But factually, the Gemara tells us that this situation never was and will never happen. Why? Because if you look at all the criteria that have to be met to bring about this result, this classic of Benzor Mora, it's impossible to meet all the criteria. The parents have this have to have the same type of voice. They have to look exactly the same, the same height, whatever it is. It is impossible to meet all the various criteria which are stated in the Torah. Therefore, the Torah tells us, Ben Sora lo hoyo, it never ever was, but the Osad Leos, and it never will happen. That's what the Gemara says in Sanhedrin. So all the questions we have, why is it this window of third, three months and not more? And this whole concept, better he should die more innocent rather than more liable. Maybe because ultimately he's going to be a detriment to society. So nip it in the bud before it becomes more serious. But it seems to be, even with Chazal saying, even though it's like a theoretical situation, it doesn't say because he's going to be a menace to society. It doesn't say because he's going to be a menace to society. Mutav Better he should die less culpable than more culpable. We're looking only looking at his own predicament. If he's going to become a criminal at a more ex- extreme level, if you can prevent that, you should prevent it even at, at, at the cost of taking his life. Not because he's going to cre- create havoc in society, because he's going to become a bandit and he's going to take other lives. It's because he will be liable for the death penalty. Stoning because he will take lives. That's what the Torah is saying. But it's low. Hoyo v'loos and leos. It never happened. It will never be. So the Gemara asks, if so, why does the Torah state it? If it's all theoretics, why did the Torah state this, this particular scenario of the child between 13, 13 months and three months steals from his parents, buys meat and wine, and he becomes a repeated offender? Why? has no relevance. So the more answer is Lidro Shul It's to study the portion and to be deserving of reward for studying the Torah. That's a simple understanding. So the Rabbi Nebachio asks if it's purely the study of receive reward for studying Torah, the Mishnah tells us in Brachos that when a person says Kriyashma in its proper time, he fulfills the mitzvah of Kriyashma. Which has not, one has an obligation to say Kriyashma twice a day in the morning and in the evening. What happens if a person says the Kriyashma after the first three hours of the day? One is already past the opportunity to fulfill the mitzvah, but he said the Shema, he said the words, Hilu Korba Torah. The reward he receives, he studied Torah since the verses of Krishma Psukim in the Torah, verses in the Torah. So saying those Psukim, he studied Torah. So he's a credit for studying Torah, but he's not a credit for Krishma. So if the only reason why the Torah wrote this particular portion is that he should receive credit for studying Torah, if one reads any portion of Torah, one receives credit for studying Torah. But why do we have to depict it in this unusual scenario where the child steals from his parents? a small amount of money, buys meat and wine, and becomes a repeated offender where he's developing an addiction. 
Why does it have to speak about this particular situation? If it's only for the sake that the one who studies it should be worthy and deserving of reward for studying Torah, it's not necessary. Let him just say the creation of anything in the Torah, he receives reward, reward for, st- for the study of Torah. So Rabbeinu Bach cites Rabbeinu Hanan here. Rabbeinu Hanan was the first of the Rishonim. Rabbeinu Hanan says that when it says it doesn't mean to study it and analyze it and to receive reward for studying Torah. That's not what it means. Meaning, we always say, what's the takeaway? There's a lesson to be learned. It's almost unheard of. Parents have the child they just celebrate his bar mitzvah. And they catch his the son, giving a scenario, 13 years old, just reached puberty. And they find him, his hand in his, his, father, his parents' purse. And he steals. And he jo- joins the kiddish club, right? He has good role models in the shul. And they serve at the kiddish club. Wine and meat. And he has to buy in advance a ticket to be worthy to go to, to be eligible for the Kiddush Club because he's a, he's a little boy, he's 13 years old. And they give him the ticket. So he has the right to come to the Kiddush Club shop this morning. His parents find out. They say, you begin be giving, be, begin behaving this way, you realize it's really to no good. You can become an alcoholic. You can become addicted to this kind of lifestyle, a gluttonous lifestyle. And the parents take him to court. The court gives him lashes and warns him. It repeats itself again. He's going to be put to death. And only the parents can bring him to court. As I said, evidence is not enough. The parents have to be involved in the process. And he becomes a repeat offender. And again, the parents take him to court. He's put to death. The average parent... Well, how does he process this type of behavior? It's immaturity. It's a phase. It's going to pass. And the parent, most times, will give the child every benefit of the doubt that this is only a moment which will not repeat itself. And even repeats itself, it's not going to lead to that. To an addiction where he'll have to support a habit which will, will actually, he may kill to support that habit. That's the average parent. But the Torah is forecasting. That's not the reality. This child will become that addict, addicted to this lifestyle, and he will ultimately, if he can't support that life, that, that addiction, he will kill. If the parents accept that as fact, because the Torah says that, what, what are the parents doing? They're allowing their love for God to supersede the love for their own child. That's the takeaway. That's the model lesson we learn from this. And what is this the equivalent of? He says this equivalent of the Akeda. Avraham Avinu was told, you could have a child in your old age and it's, this child will be the future of existence like the stars in the heaven, so on and so forth. At the age of 37, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, God comes to Avram and says, the son that was born to you in your old age, who you love, bring him up as a burnt offering. How should Avram have taken this? His love for, for Yitzchak was beyond anything we could imagine. Because of Avram understood his value, besides born, being born to him in his old age. And now Hashem says, pull the plug. Avram does not ask a question. He accepts it, and he goes with alacrity, with zeal, to to do the will of God, to bring him as a sacrifice. That's the Akeda. To suppress your feelings and negate whatever you understand, purely do the will of Hashem. Not to attribute it to immaturity or any other way you want to process it. Torah says, this is fact. If you're able to accept that, and suppress whatever your feelings are, and to see it 
not as you want to see it, but as the Torah sees it, that's the Akeda. And the many situations in life, we're, conf we're confronted with challenges that based on the way we understand it, we have difficulty submitting to the will of Hashem. But the, the story of the Ben Tzermora is, is a, a, a depiction of a parent, parents who love their child. He's just beginning life. He's 13 years old. He's just entering the adulthood. Nevertheless, the parents themselves take their child to the court because he's did the wrong thing and they understand what's coming down the pike. This itself is an expression of the Akeda. So the actual situation, it's impossible to happen. Of course, you can't meet all the criteria. So why did to write it? It's a case depiction for the takeaway to what degree does a Jew have to submit to the will of God. And if the Torah dictates it and reads the script as he does, you have to accept it. If you have that level of love and reverence for Hashem and for the Torah itself.